Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a review and I've been on a little bit of a vetiver kick lately. Just recently I reviewed uh, Creed's Vetiver Geranium. So you can go watch that review. That is unfortunately discontinued. That came out about a decade ago. Today we're going to talk about a fragrance that came out a couple years before that. And it is also a vetiver heavy fragrance. It is from the house of Christian Dior and it is Christian Dior's Vetiver. So one of my perfume god people very kindly sent me a 10 ml decant, which you can see I have uh, worn and worn and worn. I have really come to love this fragrance and um, it is officially discontinued according to Parfumo. For years, rumors have been flying that this is going to be discontinued. For years, you could buy it at the, uh, I think, store in France only, in Paris, uh, the Christian Dior, like, flagship store in, in Paris, but I believe that's done. I don't think you can even do that anymore. I think it's completely discontinued now, which is a shame. Uh, there are still bottles for sale, but if you go to eBay and you try to find a bottle of this, it's going to run you between $800 and $1,000, which is, uh, now granted, I think they're 250 mils, but still, that doesn't change the fact that that is just pain and suffering um, for a fragrance that you could find its counterparts selling for you know, 50 bucks at discounters, you could probably find Guerlain's Vetiver. So the price tag on this is very, very steep, but I think it's a very interesting take on Vetiver. So I tried to place myself sort of in the mindset of what Francois Demachy and Dior were trying to do, because this came out in 2010, okay? So early in Francois Demachy's reign as, as in-house perfumer, and I think Francois Demachy kind of looked back at Dior's history and, you know, they, they um, looked at things like this little bad boy right here. Well, before I say that, let me say, um, I think they looked at things from just history in general and the past and their competitors. So they probably looked and said, Guerlain has a great vetiver fragrance. Carvin has a great vetiver fragrance. Dior, though... Obviously, they've made notes with vetiver in them in the past. The original Dior Homme Silver Stem had vetiver. Uh, Diorella, which is what I was grabbing just now, has a vetiver note. I'll try to review this one of these days. Um, Dior Essence has a vetiver note. Uh, the original Eau Sauvage from 2006 has a vetiver note. Or sorry, sorry. The excuse me. The original Eau Sauvage from 1966 has a vetiver note. Um, but they never made an out-and-out -out vetiver. Dior has avoided it for some reason for the longest time. So I think when Francois Demachy kind of took over as in-house perfumer, he kind of just scanned the landscape and said, why doesn't Dior have a well-done, proper vetiver fragrance? We are Dior after all, right? So he probably looked and said, now is the time. But then I think a lot of questions begin to arise. Like, where do you put this vetiver fragrance? Do you put it in a designer line? You know, do you put it with um something like Sauvage you know do you market it in a designer line to the general public which god this stuff is awful um even the Parfum which I used to like I have a really hard time coming uh, maybe I'll review this one of these days but it may not be a very generous review um but where do you put it is really what I think ended up happening with the release of this fragrance and you know, I don't think they wanted it to compete with Fahrenheit or Sauvage or anything like that. So it had to go into the Privé line. And for my way of thinking, I also think that Francois Demachy knew that many people um, who are hardcore fragheads would be much more interested in this type of perfumery than, let's just say, the general public. Okay, the masses, if you will. This type of fragrance, I think, is geared towards someone who is much deeper into the hobby, in my personal opinion. So I'm going to do a fresh spray because, actually, I'm going to do a couple fresh sprays because it's been a while um, since I've reapplied. And I love the reapplication. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, okay, so a couple notes on Vetiver, the fragrance, not the, not the note itself. We'll talk about Vetiver, the note here as well. But I think an argument could be made that you know, if you really wanted to take a knock against this fragrance, it's price. Because for a fragrance that doesn't have real ambergris, real oud, you know, these high-end expensive type materials in them, to put the, it in the Privé line and charge this type of price tag, I think is number one, the, the biggest knock against it. But since Dior made the decision to put it in the Privé line, and I see why they made that decision, they had to price it where it was at. I mean, they couldn't have all these privés priced here and all of a sudden vetiver priced down here. Although, 
probably the markup on this was probably much greater than some of the others. Although maybe not, maybe some of those, you know, ouds that have some ood substitute in them are getting huge markups as well. So maybe that is not a correct statement, but it definitely feels like this fragrance, you know, when you can find Carvin Vetiver and, and Guerlain's Vetiver for, I don't know, a 50th of the price of what this is going for now, price is a big, hard knock against this fragrance for some people. But if you have the disposable income and let's say you're a Vetiver lover, this is one to really look into. Um, so that being said, I do think that you can really tell the quality right from the beginning because when you smell this fragrance, you're going to realize that um, high quality materials were used in this. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And one of the telltale signs of high quality materials that I look for is being able to smell them deep into the dry down. You know, the fragrance not just turning into a soup of amber woods or something like that, or woody ambery materials, whatever you want to call it. And I, I will say that this fragrance lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts on my skin, and it lasts in a quality state. It doesn't dissolve, it doesn't fall apart in the base, it doesn't do any of that. Um, and, and to me, you know, when I spray a fragrance at 8 a.m., now this is only four hours old, but you can see the dent that I've put into this fragrance wearing it, or this decant that one of my fragrance god people very kindly sent to me. And, um, you know, when you go to bed and it's not just some amalgamous blob, right? You can actually smell still the fragrance intact from 8 a.m. until the time you go to bed on a vetiver fragrance. Now, vetiver historically is a very long lasting note, obviously, but still that implies they are using very high quality materials. Um, I heard that one way to make vetiver sort of um, higher quality is to allow it to grow longer because they what many of these producers want to do is they want to put the vetiver in the soil, harvest it as quickly as possible so they can sell the oil and then grow more vetiver. Um, and so letting it grow longer and letting the roots go deeper into the soil actually creates a higher quality vetiver. I don't know if Dior did that, something that I heard. Either way, it's damn impressive what Dior did with this fragrance. And it's a, it's a shame it's discontinued because this is probably my favorite vetiver fragrance that I've smelled that I do not have in my collection. Let's put it that way. Although I still have yet to smell Bortnikoff's take on vetiver, vetiver nocturne or whatever it's called. I think that's discontinued too, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, there are some more, hopefully, vetivers uh, we will be talking about on the channel. So you have to remember that in all perfume, in all vetiver perfumes, almost all the vetiver you smell is natural or a derivative of the real vetiver essential oil. There is no alternative for vetiver, not like there is an alternative for oud with black oud and or limbinol and, you know, uh, cipriol usage and all this stuff or, or ambergris where they're using ambroxan that's synthesized in the lab, right? Or musk where it's white musks or, you know, synthetic deer musk or black musk or whatever it is. There, there isn't a vetiver alternative. There is vetiviral acetate, but that is basically derived from vetiver essential oil. And, and many times in a fragrance, it's used as a stabilizer. Um, man, I wish you guys could all just smell this. So think of like a rudder on an airplane. You know, the rudder on the airplane kind of keeps the airplane from drifting off course. And that's how many perfumers use vetiver and vetiviral acetate. It keeps everything kind of on the road. So the thing about this fragrance that I will tell you right out of the gate is that many reviewers, many people who I know who own this fragrance, whose noses I trust, get many different things from what I get, right? Some of them call this fragrance a shapeshifter. I've heard some people I trust call this one of the darkest vetivers they've ever smelled. And I was like, what? Because um, I completely disagree with that. For me... I don't get a fragrance that changes from one wear to the other. I don't get sort of a shapeshifter. I get a constant experience every time. But what I will say is that I get many, many notes and smells that are not listed in the note listing. It's a very simple note listing, to be fair. Um, but maybe that's part of the reason why some people get so many other things going on. But, um, you know, I've come to the conclusion over years and decade plus of kind of being a hardcore fraghead that the note listing is almost like a recommended starting point. And then what you smell along the way or on top of that is you shouldn't dismiss it because it's not in the note listing. The, the note listing is almost just like a starting point, if you will. And then you got to go, go through the maze. So just as an example, the note listing here is Sicilian grapefruit, um, a Robusta coffee, and Haitian vetiver. 
and that's it, just those three notes. But for me, for example, I smell tobacco clear as day. Actually, I smell tobacco uh, more than I smell coffee in this fragrance. There's obviously a coffee note in here, but that tobacco note almost supersedes the coffee note, and there is no tobacco note listed in the note listing, but I get it, you know, it's just part of the fragrance to me now. Um, now, here is kind of where talking about fragrances and this little hobby of ours also gets tricky because if you listen to multiple people discuss this fragrance, you're going to get multiple takes on it. So for me personally, like I said, it's not a dark vetiver. Um, there are aspects of the fragrance that can turn dark, but I would call this a very bright vetiver. Like if you made me, if you really twisted my arm, I would call this a bright vetiver because of the way that it wears on me. So, um... If, if you wanted an example of a dark vetiver, I would show you something like this, Encre Noir, or maybe even Etro's vetiver is an example of a dark, earthy, rooty vetiver. Um, some say vetivers can go kind of swampy on them. I don't really get that. I've heard some people say onion soup or something like that. I don't really get that either. Um, but I would say that for me, Dior's vetiver opens up much brighter than some of those darker vetivers that I showed you. And, uh, but I will say that the fragrance opens up very sparkly and very, very fresh and natural. And it has this brilliant gleam to it, you know, like, um, even though I said in the beginning, there was no ambrox or no ambergris because there's no ambergris listed in the actual note listing is why I said that, but it almost smells like there is a little bit of ambergris in here, giving it a little bit of this sparkle, a little bit of the sun reflecting off of the water, if you will, it opens up beautifully and natural, and it has this brilliant gleam to it, you know, there's this gleam to this fragrance in the beginning, and um, I think most vetivers you smell will have this grassy smell, because obviously vetiver is a grass. Um, if it didn't have a little bit of a grassy smell, that would be kind of weird, but, um, you know, it's, it's not as dark or smoky as Encre Noir, but it's not as grassy as Guerlain's Vetiver. Guerlain's Vetiver literally opens up like you have just done like a fresh cut of, on your lawn. It opens up very, very grassy to me. At least this bottle does. Now, different versions of Guerlain's Vetiver smell different. I have an Eau de Cologne bottle in the Listerine bottle, which came actually before this. It was a 90s bottle Eau de Cologne Vetiver. It smells different than this. Um, and I know Rich Mitch has a Eau de Cologne that goes back to the 60s or 70s. That smells much different to, to this. Um, and, and so, you know, the time that they're harvested and also reformulations and all that stuff will change. But so on the sliding scale of vetivers, for those of you who are just kind of interested in kind of ballparking where this would fall, um, I would put this darker than Guerlain's vetiver, okay? But not as dark as something like Encre Noir or Etro's vetiver, right? That's kind of the sliding scale of where I would place Dior's vetiver. Um... It's not as dark as Lalique or, or Etro's take on it. So I think what makes it smell much darker though than what it actually smells like to me is this note of coffee, this, this Robusto coffee that I talked about in the note listing. The coffee note smells like freshly brewed with a thick head of foam on top, okay? Like, um, you know, literally freshly brewed espresso beans is kind of the, the way to think of it. Robusto, Robusto coffee beans are seen as the cheaper quote-unquote coffee to arabica beans and they're higher in caffeine content um and when you blend it with this woody deeper kind of thicker take um on vetiver haitian vetiver is, is known as having this very deep thick you know it adds a, a real amount of depth to a fragrance and the coffee to me acts as like an amplifier to that rich um sort of woody uh heavier vetiver side of the vetiver. So when you blend it with the woody and deeper, thicker, richer parts, um, it acts as an amplifier. It's almost like you speaking into a loudspeaker. Think of it that way. That's how I view the coffee note in this fragrance. The coffee note amplifies the naturally occurring kind of darker, earthier notes, um, which I think are fairly subdued in some parts of the fragrance. Um, but when they need to be amplified, the coffee note here amplifies it, okay? And it, that amplification when it needs to be and pulling back when it doesn't and making it smell fresh in some places and darker and heavier in the others is to me what I think makes Dior's Vetiver one of the most balanced Vetiver fragrances of all time. Now, I will tell you a story very quickly. When I first got into fragrances, I did not like Vetiver. Like I was like, 
what, who, who would like this? What is this? You know, and then slowly as the years have ticked by and your nose smells more and more and more things, kind of like smelling real oud, you know, at first many people smell it and they're like, who in the world would want to smell like a barn or whatever they smell, uh, a, a, a paint thinner or whatever they think oud smells like. And then as, as time goes on, your nose kind of adjusts and changes and picks up different things and you start to dislike some things that maybe you liked before, right? Um, and, and so, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because this is one of those fragrances and that's a great example of why I think it really fits well into the Privé line because it's targeted towards, I think, the hardcore fragheads and they spared no expense here. You can tell, not that there's a lot of expensive ingredients in here, but they really use the highest quality ingredients when, when putting this together. Okay. So, um, that's what makes it to me one of the most balanced vetiver fragrances in my opinion. Now, you have to remember something when smelling this fragrance. Um, even though there are other notes outside of the vetiver, like for example, in the opening, you get this very crisp, um, sort of bitter grapefruit smell. Okay. So, and do you know how sometimes when you eat a grapefruit, it leaves this weird kind of aftertaste in your mouth that tastes kind of bitter and sour with a little bit of sweetness kind of hanging out in the background, almost like you took a shot of like grapefruit juice and then you chased it with something a little bit sweeter. Imagine being at a bar and asking for a shot of grapefruit juice. Fuck my life. Um, well, this fragrance has a little bit of that in the opening. It has this sort of um, robusta coffee note um, used in ex espressos, as I said. And as such, I think it's used kind of to, it has this, so Robusto coffee has this like bitter, earthy, almost like burned coffee smell. Like imagine you took a flame, like a torch, you were going to light a cigar with it and you just burned your Robusta coffee bean. Like it's, it's dark. Okay. It has this dark roasted bean, like feel burned, um, have a bit of this like earth, like this scorched earth quality to them. And that's what fits so brilliantly with the vetiver. Almost like a puzzle piece that was just made to match together. On one side, you have that grapefruit. On the other side, you have that coffee. And they just kind of come together. And if you're picking up the theme of what Francois Demachy is kind of putting down, I think he expertly selected a few notes that would complement this Haitian vetiver note to perfection. You know, it really allows the Haitian vetiver note to just show you what it has to offer. And he almost like teases out these other smells that maybe you would have missed if he just gave you pure vetiver oil. Um, so everything is meant to kind of complement the vetiver is, is what I'm trying to say. So you could easily call this a vetiver solar floor because it smells like a vetiver solar floor. Um, but I will tell you that this is for the average person. This is, this is for the person who is just not the average person, who is the hardcore fraghead, who wants to go deeper in, and explore not just a particular fragrance, but a particular note, let's say, in perfumery, like vetiver, for example. So this goes back to what I was saying when I kicked this video off, which is why this is in the Dior Privé line, because I really think it takes someone who is interested in exploring and really studying the art of perfumery and wanting to take the next step um, at one particular ingredient like vetiver. Now, someone left me a beautiful comment on one of my YouTube videos recently. They said that the purpose of all humans is to witness and appreciate the beauty and the art of the creator so we can get to know him or his mind. Okay. Now, wherever you stand on the theological religion question about God, whether it's wanting to know the mind of the creator or just wanting to dig deeper into the art of perfumery and understand all the bits and pieces that kind of make a perfume tick, um, I can't think of a much better fragrance to just put in front of somebody who wants to study vetiver. Um, it is brilliant for, for somebody who wants to kind of take the next step. They did a, they did an amazing job highlighting this ingredient, in my opinion. In fact, they did such a brilliant job that if you would have put this under my nose and told me, Ramsey, this is the new Lesson de Modabla, and they're going to send some actual Haitian vetiver along with this that's ethically farmed from some, you know, connection that they have in Haiti. Um, and they want you to kind of smell the fragrance and then smell the Haitian vetiver and try and pick it out. It would not surprise me one bit. I would have just nodded along in approval. Yep. And you easily could have told me this is the new amazing vetiver from Lesson Demo Dablas. And Lesson Demo Dabla is known for kind of highlighting one ingredient that's important in the fragrance, like ambergris, like myrrh, like vetiver, like patchouli, so forth and so on, right? Um, and, and I will tell you that Haiti 
is one of the largest suppliers of, of vetiver. Uh, I think they make up something like 75% of the market. And the reason is, is that they have a very fertile soil in Haiti. So there's this like volcanic aspect to the soil there. Um, and, and, it, and it's one of the reasons why it makes it one of the best vetivers on earth. Sometimes you'll see Haitian vetiver referred to as Bourbon vetiver. Uh, and it goes back to Haiti being a French colony under the Bourbon dynasty. It does not mean bourbon, not like the liqueur bourbon. Now there may be Sometimes people will pick out some alcoholic liqueur-like notes in vetiver, but when you see bourbon vetiver or bourbon vanilla or something like that, it's not bourbon. You know, if you ever have a reviewer go, oh yeah, you can really, you can really tell the bourbon quality of the vetiver here. They're, <laughs> they're wrong. Um, but the downside to having to use ha Haitian vetiver is Haitian, Haitian vetiver, as far as a trade goes, is literally run by the gangs. And that's not an exaggeration. So Haiti is perfectly located as a transfer port for vetiver being sold to their to the largest buyer of that vetiver, which is the United States, um, and has been for the last 75 years. It's also, Haitian vetiver is one of the largest processed exports from Haiti. So Haiti may have some other exports, coffee or melons or something um, that is not processed, that may be a bigger amount of their economy. But this is the largest processed good coming from Haiti. And for decades, many of the gangs um, would use it to smuggle drugs into the United States. They would use the vetiver coming in as an excuse to try to get drugs in. Um, most people don't realize that sort of interconnectivity of how local getting a certain ingredient, like, for example, Haitian vetiver. I mentioned the Sicilian grapefruit in the beginning. Um, how local it can be. Remy uh, did some beautiful um, videos on the Persilage channel. I forget what they called them, maybe like material, um, master class in materials, I think is what he called them. I would urge you to check those out. I think there's like 10 of them now. They're great. But I just highlight some of this information just to put it out there on how localized what you're smelling is and where kind of it comes from. And in this case, it's the Haitian vetiver. So um, Haitian vetiver is known for being more woody smelling than Indian vetiver, more having more of like this natural smoky tobacco aspect, tobacco. So as I mentioned earlier, I get this big tobacco note in here that's not listed. If you go to Guerlain's vetiver, there actually is a tobacco note listed, okay? But here, there's not a tobacco note listed, but I get a tobacco note. And it may be coming from this very high quality vetiver oil that Dior is using. So what impressed me though, I would say most about this creation out of everything, okay? Because it's not a very complex creation for me to break down, you know? Uh, um, it's, it's three notes, as I said. But the vetiver smell is very deep. You get so many bits and pieces here. The earthy quality, the dirt, the quality of the soil. Maybe that liquor quality if you really wanted to stretch it a little bit. But I get more of the tobacco, more of a little bit of the smokiness um, and the brightness of it. That's the big thing for me. How Francois de Machy was able to make this fragrance smell so bright from start to finish. You know, like I said, sometimes you get these darker elements that come through, um, the smokier, tobacco-y, earthier, um, you know, soily type elements coming through from the vetiver. But going into the dry down, you would expect there to be something else, you know, like um, you're going to get some ambers or something like that. This doesn't have any of that. But what's so amazing is that even on previous wearings, as I've said, I've put a hell of a dent in this. And every time I wore it, I'm like, okay, today I'm going to review it. And then it just never happened. So I've just continued to wear it and wear it and wear it. And I wore it, I wore it yesterday as my scent of the day and today now. Um, and, and of course, I've worn it a lot since then. But um, on previous wearings, I will be eight, nine, ten hours in. And I'll smell it and just be struck by how unbelievably fresh it smells. Like, almost like you can smell the grassier, but also like citrusy aspects of, of the composition, even into the dry down, which is impossible. The, the grapefruit note is one of the most volatile notes in perfumery. That's why it's put at the top. Um, and, and so eight, nine, 10 hours in, you're not still smelling a grapefruit note. It's just, it's impossible. Um, my guess is that what Francois de Marchi has done is blended it in such a way where he's kind of used the grapefruit and the coffee as his wingmen to try to like amplify certain notes at certain points in times, right? So the ability to kind of tease out these fresher notes 
and then make them last deep into the dry down. And I mean deep into the dry down. Really impresses me about this fragrance. Really, really impresses me. I think um, this is one of the most impressive, like under the radar Francois de Machy creations that he doesn't get much credit for because people smell this and they go, oh, it's just a vetiver fragrance. But I think it's so much more. I mean, obviously they are correct. It is just a vetiver fragrance, but I mean, you could say, is it just a patchouli? Is it just an oud fragrance? But that, those are the things that I love, you know? So I want a well-done patchouli or a well-done oud or, or that kind of thing. So, um, you know, and, and I know with Francois de Machy, a lot of, when he came into Dior, he did a lot of flankers. He did Dior Homme Parfum, which I'm going to review. I love Dior Homme Parfum. He did Fahrenheit Absolute, which is sadly, sadly discontinued. He did some amazing flankers. He did Eau Sauvage Parfum which I'm going to review. That's one of my favorite creations he's done, period. Uh, one of my favorite Francois Demachis of all time is the original Eau Sauvage Parfum from 2012 with the Myrrh. Um, and, and, you know, he gets credit for some of that. Some people give him credit and love, and they give him his flowers for some of that. Um, but he doesn't get much love for stuff like this. And I really think he should. I think... Um, I think he had the foresight, the knowledge, and he looked around and he 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 really made a correct move here. I think Dior did the incorrect thing by discontinuing it or only making it available at their Paris boutique and then discontinuing it. I think that's a mistake. What for Dior Diorama or whatever the whatever the hell the new one is, um, which uh, whatever you know, I'm not going to get into the whole Maison Francis Kirk John thing taking over or or well not. Not Maison Francis Kirk John, that's his other house, but Francis Kirk John taking over the perfu the head perfumer job. But the last thing I will say, real quick in closing, is that I don't think there's anything about this fragrance. This was originally targeted as a masculine release, okay? So for me personally, I've come across many women in my you know channel who will leave comments and stuff like that, and they'll say, hey, I love wearing like Guerlain's Vetiver, for example. I love wearing Vetiver fragrances. And even though these are marketed towards men, and, and the reason is, historically, vetiver was seen as a very masculine note. Um, so you wanted to make a fragrance more masculine? Put vetiver in it. Uh, and, and so vetiver-dominant fragrances were always seen as for men, for men. But to me, this is completely and utterly and totally unisex. It's such a beautiful smell. You know, the, the vetiver being dominant, the wingman, the, the Sicilian grapefruit, adding a bit of that bitterness, the coffee at kind of amplifying some of the scorched, earthier qualities of the vetiver, making it feel a little bit darker than it really is, I think. Um, and so maybe traditionally this is masculine, but to me, I don't think there's anything that would stop a woman from wearing this and wearing it well, you know, wearing it beautifully. Um, and so if you really want to get to know, if, you, if, you, if money is no issue and, and you can go drop a, a G on a perfume, you know, I mean, and you're a vetiver lover, don't overlook this. It's uh, it's sad that um, I'll probably never be able to have it in the collection, but man, I am color the ram impressed. Let's put it that way. I've been reviewing a lot of things I like lately by on purpose. Uh, maybe I'll do a couple negative reviews just because there's some I'm waiting to shit all over. That is just a matter of time in, in doing the review. But I've been trying to focus on some of the things I love because... You know, the collection, I was talking about this with Jonathan and, and Rich Mitch on our WhatsApp chat just the other day. But, you know, when you get to the level that we're at, and we are deep in the game. We are deep, deep in the game here, folks. Um, and, and let's say you have 700 perfumes in your collection, okay? It almost gets to a point where you have to kind of balance exploring new stuff and wearing your favorites. Because I, I have a thousand samples, okay? Literally a thousand samples of fragrances I don't have full bottles of. Now I have a thousand samples. So that thousand samples, I could spend the next five years just, just wearing new stuff constantly. Just new stuff, new stuff, every day, new stuff. But then I would never get to wear the Balenciaga Pour Homes, the Opiums, you know, the Antaeuses, the Bellamies that I love, that you guys know I love. Russian Adams work, all that stuff. So, you know, when you get to kind of the level that we're at, there's a balance. And I'm trying to balance it both for what I get to wear as my scent of the day and wear stuff I love, but also talk about new stuff on the channel. But really, the channel drives a lot of what I wear as my scent of the day because I do kind of do this for you guys. If not, I would probably be wearing much more of the things that I love. Like I would be wearing more Dior Jour. Well, I already reviewed Jour, so it gets put aside and I'm wearing other, other things. So there is this big balancing act. 
um, that has to take place if you're a perfume lover, but if you have a channel, it's even more. I've often said having a channel is a gift and a curse. It's a gift because you get to smell all of these things that I never would get to smell. Last night, just real quick, last night I wore this to bed. This is uh, Alliage by Estee Lauder. I've been in the game for, as I said, over a decade, hardcore fraghead. I just smelled Alliage for the first time yesterday, thanks to um, Andrea. And I was put on my ass. Very rarely have I smelled a fragrance that I went, that may be one of the greatest fragrances I've smelled this year kind of thing, you know? The galbanum in that is unreal. It does have some similarities to Devon, and I think Alliage and Devon combine to kind of um, influence Antoine Lee's work in Desandres, but um, it dries down much more ambery than Devon. Like, I got a lot of ambers last night into the dry down, changed into a lot of, and I know uh, Galbanum is a resin, it's a sticky resin, but I got a lot of ambers with it, um, and I was very, very impressed with Alliage. Right. But I just I just say that to say even now I'm still constantly discovering new stuff. And that's the thing about this hobby. No matter what you know, always be humble and keep in mind that you don't know anything. There are people out there who have smelled thousands and thousands more fragrances than you have. Um, and but on the other hand, if you're big time into this hobby like we are, what's great about it is you have a never ending stream of basically things to explore. Literally never ending. I mean, one, one of the greatest green fragrances of all time, I've never smelled it until now, right? It's it's just impossible. There's so much out there, it's impossible to smell everything. So where I'm going with this is don't try. You know what I mean? Don't try to smell everything. I do this for the videos, for the channel. Um, so you guys have a little bit of like an encyclopedia to kind of work with when you're um, trying to research new fragrances or stuff like that. But don't go try to smell everything. Uh, but there are some fragrances that can be like a reference fragrance to you. Guerlain's Vetiver, reference Vetiver. Dior's vetiver could even be a reference vetiver, um, but you have to have a balance, you know, and, and, and don't go buy full bottles of everything is the other thing. Sometimes you just want to smell something. Sometimes just having a decant of something is okay. You'll have to buy a decant or something like that or get it off of a friend or whatever it is. Um, but, but yes, I mean, that is, that is kind of my, my advice for the newcomers who are watching these videos. And let's say you're new to the game. Don't go from five fragrances to 500 in a year. Don't do it, you know, because you'll be buying just shit that you're going to look at a couple years later, a year later, and, and want to sell it all to go then buy what you really like. So that's kind of my two cents. Um, I appreciate everyone watching, sharing, commenting, liking. If you have experience with Christian Dior's Vetiver, love to hear your thoughts as always. Thank you to my perfume god person who um, sent this along. It's a joy as always. So cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.